Well, I was thrilled because I, I, uh, I've wanted to do a movie like this for so long, and for me, particularly growing up reading Marvel comics, to be doing it in the context of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it was really exciting. And then there's a huge responsibility, I felt, to, to do right by this character. I grew up reading, you know, first the Hank Pym Ant-Man and later the Scott Lang Ant-Man, so to really be able to bring these characters to life in the movies was, was a thrill. Uh, and it's always tricky because, you know, there's so much source material to pull from and, and um, you just want to get it right tonally. And the bar in a Marvel movie is very, very high. So um, I was thrilled, but, you know, there's, there's a pressure there. Yeah, there's definitely that pressure anytime, you know, you want a good movie and the MCU is fans' expectations are really high. What are ways to ensure that you do right by them? Well, I think it's more about figuring out what works in a comic book context and what works in a movie context. Um, you know, everything from kind of transferring what might be, uh, if you tried to sort of take the Ant-Man suit, for example, f straight from the comics and, and do that in the movies, it's going to look cheesy. I mean, they're very primary colors and it's really about, uh, you know, the design work that goes into these movies. Um, and the suit alone, to me, is, is a work of art. It's all the, the, the visual development department at Marvel is astounding, the work that they do. So it's really about kind of taking these things that have existed since the 60s and really finding what's relevant about them now and, and kind of, we are the 12th Marvel movie. So it's really finding something different that the audience hasn't seen before. Marvel Cinematic Universe is also known for its great casting. So when I heard uh, Paul Rudd was gonna play, that was the last person I expected, but somehow he, he played it perfectly. What's it about Paul that made him so well, yeah. It's funny because I, I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody that Paul would make a great superhero because I think he can do anything. I mean, he, people I think are more familiar with his comedies now, but as a dramatic actor, you know, in both movies and on stage, he's fantastic. So for me, it was exciting to be able to, to direct him as an action hero. And we talked a lot about in the, in the script, because Paul was one of the writers as well, is how we introduce him. And we first see him in the movie in a close-up. He's in prison, and he's, you know, got this stubble, and he's chiseled. And it's a very different version of Paul Rudd, you know. It was important to, in that first act particularly, to present him as this guy with some skills, you know, a guy who, uh, you know, he, he's not the character from Anchorman, you know. He's a very different guy. At the same time, it's Paul, and he's really relatable and, and fun. And I think it's hard for me to imagine Ant-Man without Paul Rudd at the center because he reacts to being pulled into this larger world of, of, you know, science and super heroics in the way that you or I would, you know, it's weird. And, and he acknowledges that. And I think that's part of what makes the movie work. And the rest of the cast also played all the roles of, you know, the sort of key. But um, Michael Pena was a, a huge fan. Can you talk about Michael Pena? What was it like on set? Pena was great because I've been a fan of his for so long and, and, you know, mostly in his dramatic roles. And I've seen him do comedic stuff as well. But he, uh, he created a character that Originally, in the original draft of the script, was a much smaller character, and you know, with Michael, we really wanted to expand it because we had Michael Pena, and he's he's so terrific, and we really wanted to create this character that he has his own hero arc as well. You know, he's he's one of the ex cons, and he's trying to make ends meet, but he finds his own inner hero throughout the course of this movie. He doesn't have a superhero suit or anything, but you know, he uh, by the time we get to the end of the movie, he's learned what it feels like to be a hero, and. He likes the way it feels, you know, and I think, you know, you, you can imagine seeing him uh, step up even more, you know, in the next movie. Let's kind of talk about the future of Ant-Man. Um, I mean, you guys are currently, are you still working on, are you working on sequel right now? Yes, we are. Are you allowed to talk about any of that, about it? Sure. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right, so is, uh, how about Giant Man? Are we going to see Giant Man, or is that? Well, that's, that's the real question. So, so <laughs> the movie, the, the sequel, uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp, which comes out, July 2018, which seems so long from now, but we're just starting to, to write and, and formulate the story. Obviously, there's stuff we set up in the first movie, uh, and it's really going to be great to see Evangeline come into her own as, as a hero, as the Wasp. Um, but I feel like in the first one, you know, we just started to sort of tap into what the larger implications of the Pym particle and, and Hank Pym's and Scott Lang's powers are. So, yeah, it'll be fun to explore all the aspects of that. In the sequel. MCU, he's going to be able to interact with other, other characters. But which Avenger are you most excited to see him interact with? Well, I loved uh, having Anthony Mackie in our movie. I mean, that was something that, that was a thrill because as a kid, I loved Captain America and Falcon. And I love Anthony Mackie's version of Sam Wilson. Uh, so that was, that was really a thrill. But I mean, I think everybody's excited to see what happens when 
Scott Lang meets Tony Stark or Steve Rogers. I mean, I, I'm equally excited to see all of that stuff. And uh, I have seen some of it. <laughs> it's amazing.